I'm pleased to welcome my next guest, Dr. Elias Zerhouni, who served as the director of the National Institutes of Health under President George W. Bush. He now joins me to discuss the need for innovation and collaboration in the fight against Alzheimer's. Dr. Zerhouni, it's always great to talk to you. And I guess as I just introduced you, I said the need for innovation and collaboration. We could have been saying that for 20 years. So mm -hmm. my unfair question to you is, what do we need? This is like one of the biggest ailments facing Americans, like number one, like top of the charts. I, I just want to get your playbook on how we dent this. Well, you know, my observation is that many people are trying and there are many efforts, and but most of those efforts, in my opinion, are subscale and subcritical, and many of them are overlapping. And it's, it's it's the image I use is that having like 10 10 foot ladders to try to climb a hundred foot high wall will not get you over the hall the wall. So it's better to build and collaborate and and try to build a hundred foot ladder to climb that extraordinary high wall that we have to face in Alzheimer's disease. And that was the idea that I pushed, if you will, because my observation was that many of the studies that are done, not just in the US, but worldwide, are primarily on Caucasian populations. We don't have a global perspective on the disease. We really don't understand the heterogeneity of this disease. And so my view is that innovation should actually be based on synergy of collaborations around the world to build what I call the, the Alzheimer cohort, uh, which the, um, you know, the Davos, Davos Alzheimer Cooperative is trying to build uh, uh, worldwide. And this is something that I think is needed. It's a little bit like the Framingham study for heart disease. We wouldn't have made the progress we made in heart disease without the Framingham study. I am dreaming of the same thing for Alzheimer's disease. So, Dr. Zerhouni, what are the barriers to that? I mean, I, I'm just there thinking, you're an expert, I'm a layperson in this, but um, for instance, in COVID, uh, or dealing with pandemics or viruses that are hitting the world, not just one country within borders. Um, I was, I've interviewed several times Richard Hatchett, who's head of the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations to sort of look at global response to the, why wouldn't we have what you're suggesting? I'm su surprised we haven't had it. What are the barriers? Well, I think the barriers are first, the issue that you face when you have a dominant um, um, hypothesis, uh, the A beta hypothesis, that has sort of shifted the whole world towards that effort. And many, many uh, companies, many uh, academics have sort of staked their lives on that hypothesis. I think we need to open the aperture. We really need to understand better the fundamental mechanisms of the disease, which we cannot do without comparing and contrasting what happens in a population that's different than ours in different parts of the world, in different environments, that knowledge is not there. Uh, there have been some efforts. I mean, NIH with the AMP uh, trials and Alzheimer's has pushed the envelope, if you will, by collating all the information that companies have and academics have to try to find new, new clues to the disease. There are over 50 hypotheses right now about why the disease develops. We also understood that you needed to, disease, to detect the disease much earlier than we did before. And we tried, I mean, the NIH had the, um, uh, the trials on Alzheimer's disease uh, neuro initiative and the imaging uh, and the biomarkers that have come up. We think, I think we are frankly facing organizational issues. The sources of funding are different. They're not necessarily coordinated, and we need to do that. And this is what this initiative that we're, we're promoting is hopefully going to do for us. You know, there, there's finally been, after nearly 20 years, a new drug, I may be pronouncing it wrong, Aduhelm, that has been conditionally approved by the Food and Drug Administration. There's some confusion over, you know, I think about how uh, uh, who would be covered into this? So the you know, Center for uh, Medicare is saying we're, we're gonna, CMS is going to uh, fund it for those patients in clinical trials, not funding those or not. So there's a little bit of wobbliness in this and, and controversy. But I'd be interested in kind of your gut feel on the FDA decision and whether it's showing 
I, I guess, you know, you've got to see where the science is and the research and public safety, but do you feel like the door is finally opening on some approvals after a very long period of nothing? Well, it is because there was a long period of nothing that the bar was changed and the risk benefit calculations that the FDA did were different than what it would have been if we had multiple drugs available. It's a very different context because you have no alternative. And so the FDA wanted to take the, the accelerated approach, uh, um, conditional approval approach, which is a tried and true approach when you have uh, therapies that are not yet proven, but need to be available. Uh, on the other hand, it's controversial because at the end of the day, there's not enough safety data. Uh, a lot of the analysis was post hoc. And so many scientists uh, feel that the evidence is not strong enough and then you get these reactions from CMS and others to try to limit uh, the use of the drug and the cost of the drug. But from my point of view, you know, I think there is a, a, a void. There is a, a problem uh, on the policy uh, level of what happens between a drug that is given conditional approval and its market use. I think we need to, to really focus on that and come up with different ideas. I have, I have my own. and. And I don't know that they will be accepted, but I really think that what I call progressive approval is a better strategy. We, I talked to the EMA, and the EMA is following a little bit of that approach. But I think the U.S. does not have that policy instrument to bring together to the table in a, in a controlled manner. That's really the, 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 the gap that I see that is leading us to this complicated uh, situation between I don't know how I'm being approved or not approved and, and you know, paid for or not paid for. So there is a void. There is something that we need to work on. Um, you know, ideas have to be put on the table. But my own idea is that we need to do a phased approval, progressive approval with increasing larger number of patients under surveillance, obviously, for side effects, and then decide if there is a full approval. You know, as we see a leadership now, uh, change now coming at the NIH, you used to run this place, is it time to begin looking at a field like this and, and asking some fundamental questions, which I know you've been suggesting, about how the NIH leverage in the process can be shifted? Um, and I guess the question I have, just listening to you and reading some of your comments, do we need to de-silo some of this research, de-silo some of the approach? Absolutely. I think the silo uh, that you describe, the silos that you describe, are really a problem in, in some ways. Um, but, but you can't really, you can really do it at the basic level, right? The basic level to me, the discovery has to be investigator initiated. We have to have these ideas tried in various uh, aspects. Diversity enhances discovery. Hmm. However, when it comes to applying what we know or what we think we know, you really need to get critical mass. You need to get a scale that today I don't think is achieved. And I think that's what the NIH should really uh, support, the at scale um, critical mass trials uh, in collaboration with others around the world, if need be, to try to, to, try to implement what we have already done in other words, we have digital biomarkers, we have blood biomarkers, we have genomics. That has never been integrated in a comprehensive fashion. And that's why I think what you're saying is, is appropriate. We need to really step back and say, okay, what can we do better? That's fascinating. I had, I had no idea that, that you know, you're, you're basically saying we've, we've leaped forward in many areas of science, but back at the mothership, it hasn't been integrated. Am I getting that right? Yeah, pretty much. I mean, it's not like they're, they're, they've not tried. I mean, if you see some of the cohorts that NIH is funding, they've made some fundamental advances. I mean, hmm. you know, the, 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 the studies, for example, of uh, brain samples, uh, that is very informative. Uh, the study of immunology and the relationship of immunology and Alzheimer's disease, inflammation, Alzheimer's disease. We have a tremendous amount of progress. I don't think all of that has been integrated in a way that at least will give us the same power that we were able to put together with the Framingham study, where we discovered many of the 
disease um, uh, markers, the, uh, the the risk factors, and we managed to reduce the mortality of of heart disease by two thirds. Uh, that's what I'm hoping for in Alzheimer's disease: ways of following the patient with digital biomarkers, with their smartphone, understanding the evolution of the disease. Why are people, some people, uh, progressing much faster than others? What's protecting the ones that were not, not advancing? That research needs to be done, but it needs to be done at scale and, and, and with critical mass. And let, let me ask you finally, and this question is a little close to the editorial edge, because I'll tell folks, you know, Eli Lilly is sponsored this. Eli Lilly is making big in, investment in this. Um, and I am very happy that they're asking this question because Eli Lilly has invested billions and billions of dollars. They actually made a movie, which I applauded, on um, a very promising drug that failed. And in the end, it, 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 it failed. It did not meet its clinical endpoints at trial. And so you know, I've always thought since watching that film, it's good for the public to know that there are failures in the research process again. But do you worry, how is our infrastructure and our relations between the FDA, the research, the NIH, uh, private firms uh, in, in proceeding? Because I worry after 20 years of there being very little advancement that companies will just you know, pick up their, their um, resources and walk another direction. I just don't believe that. I mean, I know the industry, I know government, I know academia. I don't feel that if, if given a good hypothesis with hmm. good preclinical data and cohort data that says, you know, what, what you're going after is validated from the clinical point of view, uh, that uh, firms will hesitate to invest. They have done it. The problem we had is we were blinded by a very dominant uh, hypothesis that fixing A beta would be the endpoint that you need to go, just like fixing cholesterol, uh, low-density cholesterol for, for heart disease. So, so, the, so I think the evolution is, is ongoing. I don't see a, a reluctance to um, invest in this field. After all, the reward would be enormous if we could do it, both in terms of public health as well as in terms of revenues for the industry, if they are justified by solid trials that really are going after a supported hypothesis by the on the ground clinical genomic uh, blood marker information, biomarker information that I think is lacking. Um, I can't predict right now very, very accurately who is going to develop the disease so that you can intervene early because the one thing we've learned is if you intervene too late, uh, the recovery is unlikely. So to me, Eli Lilly and other companies are doing the right thing. I think experimenting and approaching the new world of Alzheimer mechanisms hmm. is something that will require diversity of approaches and a commitment. But I think we shouldn't see, you know, academia separate from government, separate from industry, or, or U.S. separate from the rest of the world. It really requires a, a global effort. Well, that is so heartening to hear. I always love when I have like a biopharmaceutical, biopharmaceutical research set of questions. I always want to talk to you. You really uh, set me straight, and I'm, I'm grateful to hear that you think the pieces are in place. And, and, and we, just, we just need to begin to shift and keep this thing uh, moving in towards new hypotheses and check them out, uh, throw them up uh, for public scrutiny and uh, all of the issues of how science ad, uh, advances and works. Thank you, Dr. Elias Sarhuni, former director of the National Institutes of Health under President George W. Bush. Really great, grateful for your time. My pleasure. Thank you for having me.